it is our heart for, for young people that brings me here this morning. And to see what just happened is, uh, is amazing. So, church, you're be you're to be uh, committed for the prayers that you have for these young people and keep it up. They're going to need it now more than ever because you know who's coming after them? Yeah, he is. Uh, Satan's coming after them. And I'm going to, I'll talk to you about students around the world. Uh, we, as Gideons, like I said, have a heart for young people. Uh, different numbers have been talked about th this morning, but I, I do know from, from what I read that about 15% of the students in our world today who are, are under the age of 25, 15% of those say they go to church. And that's a, that's, a, that's a worldwide figure. That's not just a United States figure. Uh, I would, I, I'm sure it's a little bit more here, but I'm sure it's a whole lot less than it used to be. So Satan is in the world working today. And the only way that we're going to keep him from overtaking our children in our world today is to share with them the hope that they're looking for. They're looking for stuff. They're looking for stuff to make them happy. They're looking for stuff that are gonna, that's going to make them feel good about themselves. And they're hearing it. They're hearing what I like to call the lowercase truth. They call, you know, we, we call it falsehood. But to them, it's true because they hear it. They hear it in their music. They hear it at, at, uh, you know, on, on television. Uh, they hear it in schools. And I, I'm a school teacher. I teach senior English at Mount Pleasant High School. So I know what my kids are hearing. So they're hearing that lowercase truth. But we've got to show them the uppercase truth. And so as Gideons today, we, we are around the world are distributing Bibles. Last year was a down year for us, but it was up from the previous one because of COVID, but we, we were able to distribute a little, a little over 42 million Bibles last year around the world. Uh, this year, we're looking to get close to that $60 million uh, uh, Bible mark again. Uh, and the only way we can do that is through the support of churches just like you. Uh, I'm a member of the First Baptist Church in Mount Vernon. I'm a, I'm a Gideon second. Gideons are not some kind of super people that are out there doing what God wants them to do. We are members of the church, members of the local church. We're just an extension of you. And so I'm asking you today to join with me like you have in the past. Are you willing to put a Bible into the lost hand of a child? It takes about a dollar and 35 cents to do that. And a lot of prayer. So today I'm here to ask you for three things. One, I'm asking you to help me pass out those Bibles. I've talked to one person already this morning that might be interested in, 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 in joining us in that, but I'm going to look at each one of you men. Are you willing to put the Bible into the hands of a lost young person? If you're not willing to do that personally, help me do that. If you are willing to do that personally, I would love to talk to you after the service about, uh, about joining us, uh, joining the ministry that has been formed out of, out of the local church. Second way I'm going to ask you to help is to pray for us. I'm going to get into that more in just a few minutes. He shows us every day people that we can interact with, which he does. Did you know he's got a Jesus talk meeting for you lined up every day when you leave home. He puts somebody in front of you every day to talk to about him. Do you see it? Please pray that my eyes stay open and can, and can see that. Pray that my heart stays open. Pray that our schools stay open. We're lucky here in Wood County. Uh, we're in every school right now in Wood County. Uh, that, that's a blessing because just a couple of counties over, we're having trouble getting into all the schools, not around, not in Yugoslavia, in Texas, in northeast Texas. We're having trouble getting into some schools. Pray that those doors are open. Pray that those doors stay open. And again, around the world, pray that they're open as well. Again, uh, 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 Bibles aren't expensive. Well, Pastor and I talked a while ago, there, there's a paper shortage around the world right now. You don't think about a lot of things like that, but we can't get the bulletins printed that we're having trouble getting Bibles printed around the world.
because of paper shortage. And, and logistics on getting that stuff shipped is unbelievable right now. We're living in some tough times. So pray that, pray that doors stay open. Pray that we can get paper. My heart was touched this morning. We had our, we had our breakfast, uh, our, our rally breakfast this morning in, in, in Mineola. And I had, a, I had a presentation planned for you this morning, but I've got something different yet. I'm going to talk to you about it just real quick. The Ukraine, you know what's going on over there right now and in Russia. There are men, there are men just like you right now in those two countries that are trying to talk to churches and trying to witness to lost souls and trying to distribute that Bible that they've got in the Ukraine and in Russia. This is the communication that we got yesterday. As the war continues, Gideons in Russia and Ukraine are staying in touch and encouraging each other as united family in Christ. One association national director in Russia expressed the following to Gideons in the Ukraine. Today it is difficult for us to understand the pain that you are experiencing, but we pray for you all the time. I believe that our Lord has everything under his control and we will and will not allow testing beyond our strength. I believe that under these conditions, your testimony and preaching of the gospel will grow. We must become a response to the spiritual demand of people who find themselves in these difficult circumstances. That's what we're doing as Gideons today. In the Ukraine, people are leaving that country by, by the droves. They're saying now it's up, up close to five million people that have fled the country. They're going into uh, Poland and other countries. What I want to ask you to do today is pray for those Gideons. Pray for those ladies that are that are in the auxiliary that are that are helping their husbands in that ministry. Gideons in Poland right now are being inundated with the need for spreading hope. People right now they're 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 doing better. They're getting food. They're getting shelter. But we need to give them that spiritual food need to give them that hope that they're looking for. And the only way they're going to get that is through God's Word. I could stand up here and share with you a couple of testimonies, and you've heard those in the past, the people who just heard the pastor's testimony about the Gideon Bible. But I need your help today creating new testimonies. People who come to know Christ in a country like the Ukraine where, where they are struggling. There are millions of young people in that country right now that don't know what to do. They don't know where to go. They don't know where to look. If they can get one of these in their hands today, God said in Isaiah 55, 11, he said, So shall my word go forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. But it will do that which I please, and it will prosper whereto I send it. So today I'm here asking you, please, pray for those people and help me get a Bible in their hands so God can do his work and his work won't return for it. Pastor, thank you for the opportunity to speak for the Gideons this morning. And one, one, one more thing I wanted to say. I speak in about 12 to 15 churches a year, and I always meet family I didn't know I had. Aren't you glad we're all part of the family of God? Pray for those folks, family members we have across especially in the Ukraine and Russia today. Thank you. All right. Y'all can go ahead. While the praise team is, uh, is going ahead and getting in place, let me just, let me ask a couple of you guys, could you pass these out? These uh, are ways you can, you actually can at any point in time At any point in time, you can mail that in for the Gideons, and we'll have a, we'll in the future have a display out there. Uh, uh, this morning, you can either, if you'd like to give to the McGideons, you can include something in that, or you can, and I don't have it with me, uh, you can take one of these envelopes, they're in the pews, and if you would, just put Gideon on it if you want to give to the Gideons this morning as well. And during the regular offering, we'll give you an opportunity to help support the Gideons financially uh, as well as prayer, okay?
Jesus. Touch the hearts that don't know you and that they will come to know you before they leave this building today, Father. I do also ask you to be with Brother Danny and frame the message this morning. Just bless him, Father, and let your word be known to each one of us. I ask you to be with Miss Pat Keeney this morning, Lord, as she brings the special music. We just ask you to be with this blessed uh, offering, Father, just use it to glorify your kingdom. It's in Jesus' precious holy name.
got to tell y'all something a while ago. Believe it or not, I forgot. Any of you ladies that are living by yourselves, after what David and I found this morning, it touches your heart. Get you a life alert. Who knows how long maybe you can live. If you're by yourself, get some help. I just hold it now. Okay. It's been a while since I've done anything like this, so God's going to lead. If you could see and know just what the future holds, you never take a chance and lose your soul. Thank you much. Thank you, Pat. Just That was a surprise. I don't know that you've sung since we've been here. I don't think. And when she said, when Chad said she was going to sing a Acapulco, you know. <laughs> oh, we can go Acapulco anytime. Uh, he didn't say that, by the way. I just did that. <laughs> Wow, good morning, good morning. Well, what in the world is it all about? So I want to take just a few minutes, I'll preach a little less than normal, uh, and talk about that this morning. Because I think on a day like today, with baptisms, actually with the song, even with the Gideons, all of this goes along with, well, what in the world is going on? So I think there's some big questions. I'm going to ask three big questions ask on this day where you see people getting dunk and getting wet and, and, and singing and, and giving out Bibles and all of that stuff, questions to ask. Simple stuff. What happens when someone trusts Christ? You know how profound it is when someone trusts Christ? Radical things happen. In fact, at that particular moment, another piece of what God in the very beginning, before there was anything, already had a plan in place, was going to do something 
so that, in fact, someone could come to Christ. Because here's the reality. When you come to, when someone trusts Christ as Savior, they're forgiven. Isaiah in the Old Testament writes it like this. Come now, let's, let's talk about, let's talk about. They shall be white as snow. Though you are covered with, 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 like red, like crimson with your sin, they shall become like a baby lamb wool. You are forgiven. You know, one of the biggest problems we have, that people have, is this issue of forgiveness between each other, but especially between us and God. This is the problem. And when you trust Christ, you're forgiven. Have you done stuff in your life that you're just ashamed? You'd be ashamed to share with someone else. That you look back and go, why? What did I? Why did I? I don't understand. And the reality is, we all have that. And the good news is, when someone trusts Christ, you're forgiven. God no longer looks upon that sin. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us way back over yonder. And if I think real hard, I can think about it, but he doesn't think about it because it is gone, blotted out, covered by the blood of Christ when someone trusts Christ, you're forgiven. Now, the good news is, you know, y young folks, and there's probably some stuff that you'd just not want to confess or get out there or anything like that, uh, even at your age. But the good news is you have an opportunity now, having trusted Christ, to walk a different way. And so you don't have the burden of sin that can be overwhelming. But even those of you that are overwhelmed in your sin, let me just say, when you come to Christ, you're forgiven. And it, the sin goes from, from God's perspective as far as the east from the west, an infinite amount of place. He removes our transgression to get a fresh start. You're forgiven. What a great opportunity that is. When you trust Christ, you're a new creation. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old passed away. New has come. You are different. From the inside out, you're remade. Now, that doesn't mean everything is perfect. That doesn't mean I'll always get it right. But at the basic level, sin no longer is the authority in your life, the devil's kingdom. You don't belong there anymore. You now have a new kingdom, and you have been recreated. Can I suggest, by the way, at some level, I mean, this, this is, uh, that's what the Bible says. And so, if we look in our life, and you know, you can come down a, an aisle, you can say a prayer, you can get dunked in the water, and if there's nothing that changes, I'm a little concerned. Because here's the reality, at some level, at some place, you are now different, and it ought to show up from the inside out. Doesn't mean you, you live right all the time. Doesn't mean you don't fall in a crater and, and get stuck in the mud. But it means that when you trust Christ, you're a new creation. You're different because now you belong and are in Christ. The Holy Spirit comes to live within. And now there is, there is God himself at work from the inside out. You're a new creation. You, you have a relationship with God. 
Now in Jesus Christ, Paul says in Ephesians 2.13, you who once were far off, now you're brought near by the blood of Christ. In a world, in a world that is relationless, where, you know, relationships are Facebook friends. If there is such a thing, <laughs> you know. In the city, the, the privacy walls. In the homes, I stay in the home. And what about relationships? We're starved. We're created for relationships. And in today's world, there is a broken set of relationships. And we're in a world that's moving away from that. And people long to have a relationship, especially with God. Because we were created with our deepest, we, we, we want to be loved. We want to be appreciated. We want to be loved unconditionally. We want to be able to talk to somebody that will always listen and won't condemn. We were made for relationships. And the only relationship that will satisfy all of those needs is a relationship with Him. And when you trust Christ, you enter into a relationship with Him. Once far away, now close. People may fail. They will fail. The best person, the most desired human relationship will be insufficient, but the relationship with God is what we need. So we have somebody that will always listen. Someone that will always hear. Someone that will always care. Someone that will always be what we need and minister to the depths of our soul. By the way, then we're equipped now to minister and have a relationship with somebody else. Because I don't need, at the end of the day, I don't need my spouse to be all of these perfect things in relationship. I appreciate every one of them. But I don't have to have that because now I have a relationship with the Lord and He meets those needs. And then when we're satisfied in there, now we can enjoy a relationship, a friendship, a spouse, kids, parents. We need a relationship with God. And, and, and when someone trusts Christ, you now have a relationship with someone that cares for you deeply, deeply, deeply. And is always there. Even when you blow it, that's good, isn't it? I've, I've fallen on my face more than once. And he's always there drawing me back because he cares. And he wants to have a relationship with you. He doesn't need it. It's not dependent upon me, but he desires a relationship with me. And when I trust Christ, he brings me close to Him. Similar, we become a child of God. But to all who did receive Him, to those who believed in His name, to those that trusted Christ as Savior, He gave the right to become children of God. We were kind of nomadic when growing up. I've said that lots of times. My dad was in Pipeline. Um, he was a dope machine operator. And everybody goes, woo, that sounds... Uh, we almost got arrested one time when I put that on. But that's what he was. It was... Anyway, you don't need to know. Uh, anyway, we were nomadic. And so close relationships in Seymour and Red Springs, Texas, the other Seymour. But we were disconnected from that because we were always traveling. We were every which way. And so... You know, from a personal perspective, I don't have the extended family, and I, I'm just excited for those of you that do. But when I came to Christ, this is my extended family. Because I became a child of God. And He loves me like a father. You know, in today's world, sometimes we don't see, we don't, we're not representing that well. But he loves us like a real father loves us 
who cares for us, nurtures us, draws us, equips us, and is always there for us. We're a child of God to as many as trusted in Christ as Savior. We have the right and the privilege now, adopted into the family. We are His, and He won't ever let us go. By the way, talk about security. Now, there were times I didn't do what my mom and dad wanted me to do. But I probably was spoiled and they didn't care. They just loved on me. But boy, that's something that I learned about God from them. Is that even though I might not live up to it, I'm their child. Always a place to go. Always someone you can go to that cares and will embrace you and wrap their arms around you. Uh, I, saw, I, I saw a video. Did you see the video about the owl that had been trying? I guess they had a, a camera inside the nest and had been trying to have babies for like two years, three years. And, you know, the eggs broke. The, the, they didn't make So she was never had any kids. Well, at the rescue place, they ended up with some baby owls. They thought, ah. We'll give her some kids. They put them in her nest when she was out, and when she got back, they had a video. She was just, just overjoyed. I've got children, and she was nestling them and nestling them, and you know, feeding them and doing all the things that a mom, a parent does. When you trust Christ, you're in the family of God, and He enjoys us. We might not be one of his direct hatchlings from birth, but now we are adopted. He chose to work in our lives and to bring us into his family. We become a child of God, and we're certain about heaven. I, I, I appreciate Chad this morning saying that. <laughs> are you sure you know you're going to go to heaven? And, and the reality is someone can get saved and, and maybe not understand everything, and maybe not under... But, but, but let me just say, if you trust Christ, you can be certain you're going to heaven. John 5, 13 says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Really important. To be certain, to know that you have eternal life. In fact, I would suggest that even in, even in, well, even in the story you're saying is uh, maybe I think I'm saved. But do you know you're saved? Are you certain? Can I suggest, by the way, and this would be always my advice if somebody is uncertain and, and you, know, you share with them the truth of the gospel. If they can't get assurance, I always say, well, here's an easy solution. If you're not sure, make a decision right this moment that I want to trust Christ. Now, if you had, no big deal. But if you haven't, trust Christ intentionally. Because all those who believe, His desire is so you can know you have eternal life. Certainty of heaven. Truly, truly, in John 5, 24, uh, Jesus is saying, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes in Him who sent me has, current tense, eternal life does not come into judgment, but has already passed from a place of death to a place of life. As many as trust in His Word and trust Jesus as Savior, you at that moment in this place of death and darkness move to a place of life. And judgment no longer will come. Why? Because Jesus paid that judgment for us. You're certain of heaven because Jesus has... Well, what if I blow it? Same Savior, when He died for us, we hadn't yet committed any sin. So when we trust Christ, He forgives our sin. And from the Father's perspective, He flips the accounting table. The list of my sins, future, past, future, present, all of them, are then moved to Jesus and he paid for them on the cross. And his righteousness is moved to me. So when the Father sees me, 
He sees the righteousness of Christ. See, I've already passed over to a place of life, and I possess it right now. That's what happens when you trust Christ and many other things. But how does it happen? Simple, simple, simple. Let me just share four, four thoughts. And by the way, you can share these four thoughts and someone can get saved. Bad news. We're sinners. Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We've missed the mark. We're not perfect. We have sinned. And that's little sins. That's big sins. But the reality is we are sinners. You know, my dad used to, used to, he used to struggle when I got saved and I was witnessing to him. Well, I'm, I'm a pretty decent guy. And he was a really decent guy. And I look at those deacons down at the Baptist church and they're out there drinking and carousing. And I'm way better than they are. At least I'm not a hypocrite. And he is absolutely right. But my dad was still a sinner. You ever been to the Grand Canyon? It's a long ways across there. And I'm a pretty good athlete. I, I could jump twice as far as Chad. I'm sure, I am sure in my delusional understanding that I could jump twice as far as Chad. And we'd both die because we could never make it across. And you know, we have some really good folks. And in certain ways, my dad was a really good, moralistic guy. But he wasn't perfect. And he had sinned. And sin is falling short of, of God. And, and to be with God, you have to be perfect. Bad news, we're sinners. And it gets worse. Bad news is worse because the penalty for even one sin is death. The wages of sin is death. You know, it doesn't help me. And Now, I haven't gotten stopped. I've, when I first came back to Texas, I probably was stopped by the police five times. Now, I, I did never get a ticket because they, I, I'd flash them my concealed carry card, and some of them would go, yeah, we're good. Or they'd look at me and go, this always troubled me. They'd look at me. You ever have that problem, Chad? Where, you know, you get stopped by the police, and somebody goes, are you a pastor? It's like, does it show, you know, pastor written all over the... But the truth is, if you speed, you ought to get a ticket. Because that's the penalty for speeding. They'd have every right, and they should have given me a ticket all five times. Because that's the penalty for that sin. That's the penalty for that. I won't call it sin, because I'm sure that some of you speak. That's the penalty, and that's just. And sin, penalty, is death. Hell, separation from God forever, eternal torment. It is bad. Sin is bad. And, and, and the perfect God created us, and we chose to sin and to do what we wanted to do instead of what God wants to do, and that's sin. And the penalty for that is death, eternal death. On and on and on forever forever, forever, and I have sinned. Boy, are we in big time trouble. I once was sharing this with somebody, and the guy goes, oh, oh, oh. I mean, he literally, oh. what can I do? Good question. Because in fact, we're sinners. Penalty for sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, the good news is Christ died for your sins. We would have no hope. I would have no hope. And of sinners, I can count myself up there at the top of them. You know, I was in a mess. So he came and died in my place. That thing, that sin, that, that thing you might think about is, oh, this was horrible. Why did I do that? I ruined lives. I, I destroyed people. And Jesus died for that. 
on the cross for the most despicable thing you could imagine. The perfect Son of God died for our sins. For the little things that I could just say, oh, no big deal. He just, it's, it's, I enjoy this, and it's just something that God doesn't want me to do, but I don't care. He died for that one too. And so the good news is, though I have sinned, and the penalty for my sin is, is death, separation, hell. Christ took our place. And on the cross, he received. The wrath of God for sin. And I can't even imagine. In my life, that would have looked like going to hell to be, be tortured forever. Can you imagine? Multiply that times billions. And horrendous people. On the cross, Christ died for that sin and received the judgment of the Father for my sin. And because he was man, he could take my place. And because he was God, he could pay an eternal price for the entire world. Christ died for our sins. Even better news. You can make this applicable to you. You can be saved by trusting in Christ. God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life because He paid for their sins. You personally can trust Jesus and make it real to you. Because you see, you have to do that. The bank is full. The price has been paid. And he'll apply it to your account when you trust him as Savior. And if you don't trust him as Savior, sin still rests upon you. And the penalty for sin still rests upon you. You must trust him. Make a choice, a personal choice. Believe, trust in him. And if you do, you won't perish because he's died for you. He's taken your place. And instead of death, he takes that death and gives you, at that moment, eternal life. For by grace you've been saved through faith. Even that's not of your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. It's not a works thing. It's not a, well, I'm, I'm pretty good. I'm better than the next guy. And I for sure am better than Reed. And the truth is, we're all short. We're saved not by our works, but by faith and trust in Jesus. That's how you get saved. That's how it happened. The, the, the testimonies this morning, that's how it happened. I'm a sinner. I deserve to be punished for my sin. Jesus was punished in my place, so I'm going to trust him and what he did. So now what? Let me just real quickly and we'll be done. This is where baptism comes in. Doesn't come in yet, but now it does. Jailer saw a radical set of things that God was doing. And Paul, he's speaking to Paul, and he, he said, Sir, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Trust Jesus as Lord, and you'll be saved. And they spoke the word of, of the Lord to him, to all that were in his house, they believed, and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Because this is a physical, this, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's what Jesus did for us. He died on the cross, was buried, rose again, and now offers life to whoever will believe. It's the picture of what he's done for us. Also a picture of us. I was dead in sin, and now I rise to new life in Christ. So it's an identification with him. And with, with his people. Baptism comes afterwards. And by the way, it is so tightly coupled. Because when people got saved, they got baptized. It was unheard of to say, well, I'll get saved. I'll say some prayer, but I'm not going to get baptized. Of course you're going to get baptized. Because Jesus died for me. Why can I? I of course I'm going to live for him now. 
wasn't even a question in the New Testament. So closely that sometimes it sounds like baptism saves because there weren't Christians running around saved without being baptized. You just did it because you want to identify with him and with his people. Uh, buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. And just as Christ was raised, now we walk in a new life. That's the picture. And can I say then also, it identifies us with him, but it also identifies him with the church. Because here's the reality. Don't believe the lie that you can run around and be spiritual on your own. The, tr the reality is the New Testament is about about ministering in the church and through the church. This is essential to our lives. Day by day, it says in Acts 2, uh, after, Paul, after Peter preached and people uh, got, got saved, uh, they were attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, and they received food with gladness, generous hearts, praising God, having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to their number day by day, who were being saved, the church is critical. You need to connect with the church. And I make no apologies. That's just the reality. That's what the New Testament is about. We need each other. Identify with his people. Identify with his church. And then two other things. Grow in him through God's word and prayer. As newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow Thereby, the Word of God is sufficient. The Spirit of God works through the Word of God to be sufficient to change us, to understand, and to change us. Desire the pure milk of the Word. You desperately need to intake the Word of God to live a new life. Grow in Him through God's Word. Grow in Him through prayer as we respond. We, we read the Word and, and we understand and then, we, then we, we talk to Him in prayer. Philippians 4, 6, Don't be anxious about anything but in everything by prayer, supplication, thanksgiving. Let your requests, all kinds of different ways, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We read the Word of God, and we pray. We talk to Him. We see the Word of God, and it says, Boy, this is a problem, and I am having struggle. We ask God, help me, empower me, change me. And the rest of our lives, we're listening, and we're talking. Growing in Him. And then finally, we serve Him by serving others. Paul, after he, he was talking to the, to the Ephesians, and he wrote, and he said, For me, pray for me that utterance may be given to me, that I might open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. We share with others this great salvation. How can we not? How can we not? Not because the preacher said, I'm, I feel really guilty. I feel really guilty because I'm not doing what I ought to do. No. Look what he's done for me. And my neighbor desperately needs the same Jesus. My friend desperately needs the same Jesus. Andrew going, oh, I found the Messiah. Wait, 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 wait there, Jesus. I'm going to go find my brother. Peter, he needs the Messiah too. And so Paul says, help me to be, continue to be bold to make known this truth that Jesus died for sin. And finally, within the church. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. It's not about me. I'm serving him. And I'm serving him by serving each other. And by the way, this is why the church is so critical. We need each other. I need you. You need me. And together, this body that's weird, diverse, it's got its ugly parts. I'm going to be careful who I look at. <laughs> it's got its beautiful parts. It's got those that are powerful and those that are weak. And together, and together, we serve Him.
and grow together. Father, we invite you now to speak to hearts. Well, what a great day it's been. And in the last several weeks, lives were changed. Lord, would you help each of them to be encouraged and strengthened in their faith to walk with you. Help us to be a blessing and a, and a means of ministry to them. And Lord, may those around us, maybe somebody here today that, that, that even if they're a member of the church, maybe they've never trusted Jesus as personal Savior. Help them to trust Him today. Maybe there's others here that are visiting that, that need to trust you as Savior. Help them to trust you today. Oh Lord, what a great thing it is to know that we're in the family of God, our sins are forgiven, that we're assured of heaven, and you're at work in our lives. Speak to hearts. And for those of us that are Christian, help us to stop making it about ourselves, but instead see that we need to serve others by sharing Jesus, by ministering to each other in the church. Cause us to respond now, whatever way, you desire, whatever way you speak to our hearts, help us to respond in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me? If you need to make a decision today, would you slip down here and uh, we'll pray with you. Uh, we'll have somebody share with you the gospel if you need to be saved. However way you need to respond, would you respond? Give us tomorrow We have today His heartbeat is a gift from you Jesus and that is why I must say have you way have you way have you way in my heart fill me Fill me up, fill me up with your love. We are not promised tomorrow. We only have today. His heartbeat is a gift from you, Jesus. And that is why. Have you way? Have you way? Have you way in my heart? Fill me up, fill me up, fill me up with your love. I don't know when I finally see face to face. y'all for being here this morning. A couple of things. One is, I want, uh, if y'all can take, can I have y'all stand up front so that uh, the church can just, oh, right down here is fine. Okay, oh no, we're okay. We're okay. All right. 
All right, and so they'll have a chance to come by and, and shake your hand and just say, boy, we're excited for you, we're praying for you. All right, and then also the Praethers came this morning, and Steve, uh, Steve and, and Judy, and Judy is, uh, comes by statement, and uh, Steve is going to get baptized tonight. Already been saved, been, <laughs> been saved since maybe 12 years old. It, it, at camp, by the way, this is a promotion for camp ministry and a fundraiser coming up. But he was saved back 105 years ago. Was that something like that? <laughs> 110. <laughs> anyway, so he's, but he's never been baptized. So he's going to get baptized in the lake tonight. And if the alligators don't hold him down, uh, we'll be able to have ice cream afterwards. So ice cream tonight as well. Oh, my. Good. Well, praise the Lord for that. Praise the Lord. And I'll second the mic thing is, Reed, you need to go home and get you one of those things so you can press it if you fall down. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean. That, that, that really is important. If you live by yourself, can you imagine? Just this is a side, and I'm just talking so this doesn't count. If it had happened on Monday... She might have been dead over just falling. And so, boy, that's something you really need to take care of. All right, okay, so uh, anything else before we dismiss? Uh, David, would you kind of stand up here too and, and let, them, let them say hi to you and, and praying about the Gideon ministry? And if you didn't, put in, if you didn't give in the offering, uh, you can always still give it to us. We'll put it in the other offering, or you can actually make it in as well. I, I believe in Gideons. All right, okay. I need to shut up so we can be gone. I was having a really good day till then. <laughs> Jerry, why don't you close this in prayer? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful day you've given us. Thank you for these youth that have come forward to, to show their love for Jesus and to be here with us today. Thank you for their families that have come here to support them in this great day in their lives. Thank you for everything that you do for each